Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for being here. I'm just going to take a moment to let folks trickle in and then we will get started. Welcome, good afternoon, and thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you all for being here this afternoon and welcome to the webinar entitled Early Literacy, Let's Continue the Learning. This webinar is brought to you today through a partnership between the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the Massachusetts Reading Association. This session is being recorded. Zoom can provide a live transcription. You can click hide subtitles or show subtitles at the bottom of your screen to control this feature. My name is Katherine Tarka. I'm the Director of Literacy and Humanities at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. I'll be your host today. I'm joined by a number of colleagues from the Massachusetts Reading Association to co-lead this webinar today, including Patty Kelly, Holly Banashevitz, and members of the Knobscott Council in the Massachusetts Reading Association. We're so glad to have you all join us here today as we hear from our featured speakers, Lisa Hannafin and Beth Villani, and continue our collaborative learning together about evidence-based practices that support language comprehension and fluent word reading in early literacy. Hello, it's so great to see everyone in the webinar today. My name is Patty Kelly and I am the vice president of the Massachusetts Reading Association and the treasurer of the Knobscott Reading Council. MRA is excited to collaborate with the DESC to present this webinar series on the Mass Literacy Guide. It is the Knobscott Reading Council's honor to ask specific questions of our educator panelists. As you can see on the agenda slide, Catherine will give a mini dive into the Mass Literacy Guide and most of our time will be spent in a panel discussion with Knobscott Reading Council members, Abby Hendler, Nancy Vertolino, Terry Marr, and Sherry Alleman asking questions of the panelists. After the panel discussion, we will have some time for questions followed by a reminder about our next webinar. Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Patty. Um, participants, as you've already heard, this webinar is being recorded. Today's recording will be posted on the Mass Literacy site within about a week or two. If you visit the Mass Literacy top resources page, you'll find the recording of today's webinar and all of our previous webinar recordings. You may be wondering, where's that website? Where do I get the link? A page with all of the links referenced in today's presentation is being dropped into the Zoom chat for you right now. We call this our webinar link sheet. You can reference this link sheet for any links that are mentioned in today's webinar so that you don't have to rush to write things down or scramble or worry about losing track of any links that are shared today. And so if you open up that link sheet, you will see the link to the top resources page on the Mass Literacy site that I just mentioned. If you have any questions during today's presentation, we encourage you to use the Q&A feature that you see on your screen as part of the Zoom app. We'll be monitoring that throughout the panel discussion and we will get to as many of your questions as we can after the panel discussion. To get started, let's just talk a little bit about mass literacy, an initiative that undoubtedly many of you here today are already familiar with. Mass literacy is a statewide effort to empower educators with evidence-based practices for early literacy that all students need to become successful readers and writers. What you're looking at right now is an image of the Mass Literacy Guide homepage, and there's a link there for you. If you haven't visited the site yet, you can check it out after the webinar. The Mass Literacy Guide is an interactive site that includes current research, information, and resources 
to empower educators with evidence-based practices for early literacy. The Massachusetts Reading Association was an important partner in the development of the Mass Literacy Guide. The department is so proud to partner with MRA again today to bring you this webinar in support of our shared belief that evidence-based instruction provided within schools and classrooms that are culturally responsive and sustaining will put our youngest students on a path towards literacy for life. When you explore the Mass Literacy Guide, you'll find a wealth of information regarding literacy teaching and learning. There's information on using complex text, on fluent word reading, language comprehension, students experiencing reading difficulties, equity in literacy, and much more. In a few minutes, the members of our panel will speak to some of their evidence-based practices as well. I just wanna take one more moment to introduce you to a key section of the Mass Literacy Guide that will be especially relevant for our panel discussion today. This is the Skills for Early Reading section of the Mass Literacy Guide. This page lays out the skills that contribute to early reading proficiency and it's organized according to the simple view of reading. The simple view of reading, which you may have already heard quite a lot about in recent discourse, is a cognitively based theory that asserts that to learn to read, children must develop both fluent word reading and language comprehension. And this theory has held up over a long period of time in many studies. The skills that underlie fluent word reading are all on the left, on the orange side of the graphic, and that includes phonological awareness, phonics and decoding, and automatic word recognition. And the components of language comprehension are all within the right side of the graphic, the blue side. So that's where you'll find vocabulary, morphology, language, syntax, grammar, and higher level language skills. Today's educator panelists will be speaking about the instructional practices that they use on both sides of the equation. And now I'd like to welcome my MRA colleague, Patty Kelly, back to the mic to share a little bit about our partnership. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Back in the summer of 2020, Catherine asked MRA to partner with DESE to review the document that educators and literacy experts had developed, highlighting the research in evidence-based practices in early literacy. MRA was honored to do the work and provide feedback and suggestions for the guide. To that end, we began the webinar series on October 21st with Margaret Goldberg presenting. Today is the second webinar in the series, with the final webinar being held February 1st. Our next slide, slide, please. MRA's mission is to promote, to promote literacy for all learners through professional development, research, publications, and advocacy. We welcome you to join the organization. It's a great opportunity for you to be involved in literacy projects and activities that are organized by MRA and local councils, such as the Knobscott Reading Council. It's a great way to meet other educators who are as passionate about literacy as you are. Please go to MRA's website, massreading.org, or email us at massreading at comcast.net to learn more. Catherine, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Patty. And now let's get on to the main event. We're so pleased to have two esteemed Massachusetts educators here for a panel discussion today, Lisa Hannafin and Beth Polani. They'll share about their journey in evidence-based early literacy and share some of their classroom practices. Lisa Hannafin is a grade one teacher at the Linden Steam Academy in the Malden Public Schools. She was one of 50 Massachusetts educators who worked with Desi on the development of the Mass Literacy Guide. Lisa has been the featured speaker at previous mass literacy webinars on fluent word reading, and her classroom instruction will also be featured in an upcoming mass literacy guide video. Beth Villani is a reading specialist at the Sweetser School in the Pentucket Regional School District. Her insights and classroom practices are also featured throughout the mass literacy guide. Welcome, Lisa and Beth. And now I'm going to stop screen sharing so that participants can see our panelists, Lisa and Beth, and I invite members of the Navscott Council who will be facilitating the discussion to come off video and get the conversation started. 
Thank you and welcome to Lisa and Beth. We're so glad you're here and are excited to hear what your answers are to all of our questions. <laughs> our first question is, um, we were wondering if you could describe your journey to evidence-based early literacy. Um, sure, I can start. Um, thank you um, everyone for coming and thank you all for having us today. Um, for me, when I sort of reflect on my journey, um, three major experiences um, really shifted my practice. I was um, trained primarily in balanced literacy um, and three things that happened just over the past four years, um, the sort of the what, the, the tools that I learned um, about was during Curate for DESC, um, I sat on a panel and it was my first experience really unpacking high quality instructional materials in different curricula. Um, and also um, it was my first ex exposure to ed reports and what that was. Um, so that was, that was the first thing. Then at the same time, I was enrolled in the dyslexia, dysgraphia and dyscalculia course um, through Crafting Minds with um, Leandra Ilion and um, Melissa Orkin. And that sort of showed me the how about the science of reading and sort of how the brain actually learns to read. And that was super eye-opening for me. I learned about um, David Kilpatrick and uh, phonological awareness was um, a really big piece that I discovered that I was missing um, from my practice at that time. Um, but something, a, a big takeaway from, from that particular course. And then the third thing, sort of the why, um, was I was reading The Knowledge Gap by Natalie Wexler and also um, listened to Emily Hanford's podcast. Um, and that just exposed the inequities um, that existed. So those, those three things really shifted my practice and kind of led me here today and I'm still on the journey. <laughs> I am not an expert. <laughs> so my journey started back um, at the beginning of my career. I completed a graduate program in Virginia. And I remember walking into the classroom for the first time and we had the biggest binders full of research um, about phonics and how to explicitly teach phonics to students. And we really dove deep into the science of reading. And my favorite part of the courses was really, like Lisa had um, mentioned, the cognitive underpinnings of reading development. And during the graduate program, I was a reading specialist and I was able to take what I was learning and put it into my daily practice. And that was ongoing throughout my program. So then, what happened is I moved back home to Massachusetts and I was so excited to become a classroom teacher in the primary grades to teach a whole class of students how to read. So walking into my you know, first year of being a classroom teacher, I was giving curriculum that I remember saying to myself, this doesn't make sense. We had prompts that we were supposed to use saying to students, look at the first letter of the word, what sound does that make? And now guess what that word is. And it went totally against everything I spent many hours learning about in my graduate program. I remember having conversations with colleagues and my administrator saying, but this is going totally against what, we, what I've been learning and what makes sense with reading development and brain development and how people learn how to read. So I remember having a conversation with one of my um, favorite administrators who truly became a very influential mentor for me. And she said, when you know better, do better. And from that point on, I felt like I had permission to continue my learning. So I'm always looking for new courses. I'm always reaching out to people. Um, reading the new books and trying to reflect and really say, our students are puzzles. And when you get those students that aren't 
meeting their fullest potential? What can we do better to help that student be successful? And like Lisa was saying, I'm not an expert, but I do spend a lot of time reflecting, talking, sharing, collaborating, and trying to learn more because I want to make sure that I'm not part of the puzzle where I let students fall through the cracks. I don't want that to happen on my watch. And that's really the core of my journey in teaching literacy and um, teaching students. Thank you both. It sounds like very reflective journeys. Um, if we were to observe your reading groups, what might they sound like or look like? So for me, um, I actually utilize a lot of toys um, in my reading groups. Um, I use slinkies for phoneme seg and um, we, we use them for uh, blending. I, we segment words and then blend them back using the slinkies. Um, um, I use a lot of, um, I, I put together a, I wanna show you. This is actually, the link is actually in, in um, the sheet, but I use um, word mats a lot. Um, this particular one came from the University of Florida um, and I created it, created many, so that it's all Velcro so that you could actually, depending on the group I'm with, um, I can easily uh, just take it off, you know, take off different sheets. Um, some kids, um, you know, need the alphabet chart to actually um, do some of the phonics work that we're doing. Whereas other kids, um, we might be working on like syllable work. They don't need the letter chart. So I, I flip things around. I, I have it all, um, it's all Velcro. Um, and so I use, I do use this a lot during um, my ex sort of explicit instruction. Um, and we um, also, uh, for me, the, the one, like where I get the most bang for my buck is sort of the application of the actual, whatever skills that we're, we're working on that I'm introducing. Um, I want to make sure in front of me, because that's a piece that I was always lacking, I felt like, um, is that I'm very much intentional about applying the skill and not just, um, you know, reading, not just them um, practicing, say like writing out the words, but really applying it with, you know, doing either, either words or actual, um, an actual decodable passage. Um, because I feel like, like I said, that was just a piece that um, I, I wasn't, I don't feel like I was doing that, them the justice of, of them actually having the time to practice. Um, so um, uh, yeah, that's pretty much. Um, and we also do a lot with phonemic awareness. I, I do do phonemic awareness in my small group as well as in my whole group. Um, as a Title I specialist, um, just to throw in a piece of what you might not see in my small group is all of the pre-planning. So I spend a lot of time working with assessments, completing uh, phonic screeners and phonological awareness screeners on all of the students that I service. Um, the data is analyzed. I really take a lot of time to triangulate the data because it's so important to figure out the point of breakdown with our students. And that's how I start my planning for the small groups. So within the small group work, and I have several groups throughout the day, and each one will look different based on what the students need. So similar to um, what Lisa was saying, we warm up with some phonemic awareness drills. We do a lot with Hegarty and hand motions to try to make it multi-sensory. I do a lot of work with um, Elkonen boxes which you can use chips or gems or even unifix cubes where they push up each sound for the word, they blend it together. And then we have lines for them to start to match the graphene to the phoneme. 
I do a lot of work with, um, and a little piece to tie in with the phonemic awareness drills is even though I use a certain um, curriculum, I try to match it up to what we're doing for the phonics drills. So I will change the suggested words um, within the pho uh, phonemic awareness drills <laughs> so that it matches up and ties in with what we're doing for phonics next. So if we're doing the vowel consonant E, then all of the activities that we're doing, like if we're doing odd man out for rhyming, I would have cake, bake, and cat. So that not only will the kids see the vowel consonant E in print when they're doing the writing and when we're putting using the um, letter tiles, but they're also hearing it. And having those two pieces blend together really helps students achieve and make strong progress. We do a lot of work with sound walls. Um, mm. I know in the beginning of my career as a classroom teacher, we had word walls. And most of those word walls weren't really used um, or very, you know, the students didn't fully engage with them. So with the word walls and I found um, these great pictures where, especially now during the pandemic, we're all masked. So it's so hard. I still like cue myself from habit for them to look at how my lips are formed. We feel where the sounds are coming from. So these have really come in handy um, for the past couple of years so that they actually have a picture of a child and how their mouth should look when they make a certain letter. We review the sound wall with the sounds that we have done before, before we introduce the new sound. There's a lot of um, explicit instruction. It goes pretty quickly once the routines are set in place. The, I really firmly believe in the gradual release of responsibility where we do I do, we do, and you do. There's decoding and encoding routines. Um, I do a lot with word sorts, the word work mats that look a little bit differently. And then with the high frequency words, one of the changes in practice that I started recently is using the heart word method mm -hmm. through really great reading. And this has really helped the students to make the connection to see that all right, I know some of the sounds in these words and there's only certain parts that I have to memorize by heart instead of doing it the old school way of flashcards. Um, the students will wrap it up by working with connected text and depending on their skill area and where we are, um, it starts at the word level, it might be a word list, the phrase level, passages, or full decodable text. And that's supported and um, the students independently read that as well with teacher input. And we have um, usually hopefully have enough time for the dictation part where they might do some sentence writing and independent writing on the skills that we have worked on. So many great ideas. <laughs> Terry. Thank you. Okay, um, Lisa and Beth, can you briefly describe what your literacy block looks like? Um, sure, I do um, whole group um, and I do whole group Hegarty. I do whole group following my spoken sequence. I, so that I'm exposing all the kids to the skill in the spoken sequence. And then um, we break out into small group work. And I pretty much do a very similar routine to what I do whole group um, within my small group so that I'm not having to like recreate the wheel. I just, um, you know, swap out whatever skills it, are, it is that the kids in front of me need. Because some, you know, uh, as you know, some may be a little more striving than others. Um, but my kids who are not working with me um, are it working in, in small groups, um, center type 
um, word work, vocabulary, um, syntax, uh, um, sort of a, um, a retelling of stories using sentence frames. Um, trying to think of what other, um, I have a heart word center. Um, and then we, once, once they do the small group work, then we come back whole group um, to work on our text. And that sort of, again, because during that, during that time that I'm in my small groups and, and the kids are, I also have um, reading interventionists that are pulling my kids. So once everyone's back, um, we do, I, I'm, lucky, I'm fortunate enough that I have the time to do a whole group lesson with engaging with complex text. And so I do that whole piece um, at the end of my, my block. So um, I'm fortunate for that, I feel like. And I, should, I could also add that my group, my groupings, when my kids, I pull my groups um, that are, are sort of leveled to see me, but my center type work and the work they're doing, um, I try to make my centers so that they're more heterogeneous and everyone can sort of contribute and feel successful in the group. So, you know, I, I may have may have some kid, they're they're different, they're different levels, reading levels, but yet they're able to, um, or they're working on different skills, but they're able to sit together. Um, and you know, maybe, maybe some are reading full sentences, whereas some are reading words. Um, but I do I do try to try, try to always have them, um, you know, sort of all working together and feeling successful. And from an interventionist standpoint, um, when we push in to do the inclusion support, what's a wonderful piece to this model is when we collaborate with the classroom teachers, we're able to say, you know what, for this skill, these two other students haven't mastered it yet. So we're able to continuously change groups to meet the students' needs. Yeah. And it's very fluid. So when we co-plan together, we figure out like, Lisa, we have a very similar model in our school as to what <laughs> we describe. So we're able to talk about the next week. What are we seeing? What students haven't mastered certain skills and how can we change those teacher directed tables so that we can really push the students to meet mastery. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we're, we've been asked to kind of skip some questions because of time. So um, I uh, was just asked if uh, we could skip Nancy and go to you. Um, question five, Nancy, can you do that, please? Hi, thank, thank you guys for putting yourselves out there. I know it's, uh, you've been teaching all day and you're doing this now. So this, this is really great, it's very helpful. <laughs> Um, so my question is about, um, and I guess it's really um, directed to, to Lisa. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you use read alouds um, to support critical consciousness? And, um, and how do you think about, or how do you use literature to leverage student assets? Um, yeah, so um, I do a lot about building community, culture, I am in a, um, I believe, if not the diverse, one of the diverse, most diverse um, linguistically, and I, I believe culturally, um, districts in the state. Um, so the center of our room is from the first day, um, we have a big world map and the kids' pictures are all around it. And I um, put up their language they speak their languages and um, we um, sort of map it with using just string, you know, to each country, their home countries. Um, and that sort of starts us off just sort of building that classroom community, but also just the importance. I want them to know that knowing other languages and, and multiple languages is an asset. Um, and so that's how I kind of start off. Um, 
I, um, above that is we talk a lot about this quote and it's, um, we are unified, we are diverse. I do, I do some work with um, Ubuntu um, and um, we just actually finished doing that. And um, we talk about where Ubuntu comes from, what it means. Um, again, meaning that we might look different, but yet we are still connected. Um, we talk a lot about diversity and that diversity doesn't just mean the color of our skin or what we look like on the outside. Um, I try really hard not to make assumptions about my kids um, mm. based on their color of their skin or um, we talk about, you know, we read books on family, different family makeups. I've had kids who use um, pronouns of they, them, their. Um, so we've had really deep discussions about that. Um, also, you know, families that may have two moms, two dads, kids that live with nan grandparents. Um, so we look, when, we, when, when I talk about books, um, we talk about a critical lens and I'll say to them, put on that critical lens and they do put up their little, their little um, glasses and we talk about what do you think this book, this book is? What do you notice about this book? What, is this a window? Is this a mirror? Um, you know, is it going to open up um, the world for you? Um, or is it you're just seeing yourself or are you not seeing yourself and why? Um, we, as myself, as an educator and, and to um, even with the kids, I have a, a chart in my room and it has three questions and it says, who benefits from the stories, who writes the stories, and who's missing from the stories. And so we go into a lot of um, a pretty deep discussions um, about what that means. And again, um, you know, stereotypes and just by looking at a cover of a book, well, you know, the book may actually not be what you think it's about. And I'm really mm -hmm. conscious of, of, I want my kids to have strong role models. I want them to see strong characters. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I did just bring a book today because um, we actually just read this the other day. This is a, a, a fairly newer book, I believe, um, but it's called Nana Akua Goes to School. Mm -hmm. And they absolutely just love this book. And one of the things that I had actually really loved about it was that it talks a lot, it can bring in so much about identity and culture. Um, Nana has markings She's from Ghana and she has markings on her face that was, you know, was what they did. That was a sign, um, you know, of, um, her, that her parents were so happy she was born. Um, and, um, uh, the, the little girl in the story is bringing Nana to school for, um, grandparents day. But what I liked about it, she's so concerned, like, what we typically see with little kids, it's not because she's self-centered and she's worried about what kids are going to think of her. It's what she's so worried about Nana's being, her feelings being hurt, mm. you know? And it's just a different perspective. Um, and there's so much figurative language. It's just, yeah. I just love it. And I love the author. Um, she's writing from experience, Trisha Elam Walker. Um, and there's just so much you can do with it. But anyway. Um, so this is, this is a, a book um, that we, I just recently used. Thank you so much for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. It's a great book. I know it, it gets to your heart. I, I, oh. yeah. the, the kids are like, can we do those tattoos? You know, they want to do the symbols like on like, uh, how they do the story, you know? And I even think of it, how good that is for first graders, but also to re, to relook at it you know, in, in later years when you're studying immigration or indigenous peoples right. or, you know, yeah. that you really need that background. Um, I mean, this is a huge question for both of you, but can you talk a little bit about how and why you use complex text? So you've said a little bit, oh. you know, yeah. already. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I use complex text. Like I said, that particular book um, was, is great because it has figurative language in it. So I, I have a little boy in my class um, who is um, visually impaired, so mm -hmm. pretty 
um, you know, he's, he's pretty severely visually impaired, um, uses Braille. So I project everything on my JTouch. So I mm -hmm. will either upload the slides of the stories I'm doing, or I um, am fortunate enough sometimes to find them in PDFs. But anyway, um, so I, and then I print out certain um, parts of the text because I don't have, I, I'm not, I don't have the luxury of everyone having a copy of the books that yeah. I have. So mm -hmm. I, I do select certain pieces of the story to practice sort of reading all of us, regardless of level, like to build, just mm -hmm. to hear the story, to build, do the repeated readings for fluency. Um, the vocabulary is like incredible that they're learning. Um, mm -hmm. I create a um, interactive vocabulary wall um, I did it during virtual learning, but that this has become a center in my classroom where I can, I can put it, it's in Google Slides, but I can put it on the JTouch. The kids, it's a visual, it has a picture, the word, and it has the word, the picture, and then they click on the, the little, um, mic, um, like heat ear thing and they can hear me. It's my voice and I'm telling them the definition. And um. so they'll use like a Freyer model to, um, complete in that center for each of the words mm -hmm. um, using either pictures, depending on, on, you know, what, what um, you know, what their level is or whatever. And I, I don't, I, I don't like to keep using the word level, but you know, if there's somebody that yeah. needs to draw pictures, but they, um, I want them to all have access and I want them to, I want them to do that productive struggle, engage in productive struggle. I think that's so mm -hmm. important. You know, I've always started my, my expectations, I have a special education background as well, and I think that's part of it, but I've yeah. always started my expectations really high and I scaffold down if I have to. Because my mm -hmm. feeling is the kids that can get here will never get here <laughs> if you start here. Right. right. You know, so they yeah. all, you know, when I hear like, I can't read, I can't do it. And I'm like, put your finger here. I mean, we've done, we just did a story today where we, I was, explaining what indentation, indenting meant because it had two paragraphs, the thing I printed out today. Mm -hmm. um, and they were able, you know what, they're annotating their sheets with me. They're using the word impassable. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that was one of our and, uh, economical. So that's how I, I use them. <laughs> um, you know, building that language, vocabulary, fluency. And I that you can agree. only get from complex texts. Exactly. And yeah. I agree with you, Lisa, because we have to level the playing field. Like through my work in different districts, there's such an adequate um, inequities where like if we don't share these wonderful complex texts and teach to them and, and coach the students, they're not going to see them. I have so many students at home that don't have a book at home. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. not read to. They're, the vocabulary isn't discussed with them. So we have to be their advocates to expose them to this wonderful literature, to mm -hmm. bring those experiences to them and to work with them. You know, like you were saying, this is just yeah. a simple little scaffold of a semantic mm -hmm. map based mm -hmm. on a nonfiction text that the students were reading about bears and they were able to brainstorm there were questions on it you know what does the bear look like where does it live they were able to take that information out even if they needed a scribe and then they were able to write about the animal mm -hmm. and they're proud of their work and then at the end of it you see them sit up like a peacock and they're so <laughs> proud saying look at my writing i did it yeah. And I always so, remind okay. them, I knew you could do it. Yeah, it's the knowledge. It's like building that knowledge. I, I look back and I cringe at some of the things Oh, in like the basal texts or, you know, basal readers where I, I realize, you know, if I think back like, okay, well, hmm, what did they learn last week? And it's like, they weren't, really didn't learn knowledge. They just re were able to recite the story yeah but they didn't learn knowledge you know um and that's where that complex text comes in that that's when they're going to use that you know in the future um the next question i'm supposed to ask is 
is what does it feel like for you when uh, when a striving reader is able to successfully sound out a word or read a sentence? Um, what does it feel like for you as a teacher, and what does it feel like as a you know as a student? How do they how do they share what it feels like? Oh, well, they're so excited. <laughs> they, they are. Um, I just know, like, when a child doesn't understand the alphabetic principle, all they're seeing when they're looking at a text is squiggles. And then you can see through their eyes when the squiggles mm -hmm. become representations of what the sounds are. So then they become letters. And then those letters become words. And then they figure out that the words have meaning. And sometimes the words will tell a story. And every moment that those connections are made, you can see their shoulders drop. You can see the smile. And I love those moments of when they say, I did it. I can read this and I didn't need your help. I yeah. always joke with my students and say, I would love for you to work me out of a job. Like <laughs> I want you right. to be independent. <laughs> and I always like we make a big celebration when they make that milestone and I always make a point of jumping on the phone right after school to call the families and say listen there's a book coming home or a passage coming home in their folder they're able to read it independently make it into a celebration you know this is a day for cake and ice cream or whatever <laughs> your favorite treat is and have your child read to them and the parents love those phone calls um and honestly as a teacher it every time it brings a tear to my eye to see yeah, that connection it is to fruition i i sometimes feel like such a nerd because i'm in my classroom my own little class my own little world and i'm like oh my gosh you're right you know um I, like for me um this is my first year being able to implement a sound wall that without being mm. virtual, where I have all the kids in front of me. And it's like, you know, I think it was actually during my observation, I was doing a, um, uh, I was doing some phonemic awareness. And one of the kids said, you know, I said, saw, I used the word saw. And I said, do you know what it, an another, you know, word, another meaning for saw is, you know, do you know what that is? And she was like, like, ah, because when we, we always recite our, our sound wall every day, mm -hmm. regardless if we learn the sounds or not yet. And she's, and when we get to awe, we always go, ah, like the baby. And so she said, oh, like, ah, the baby, you know? And, and she no, got up yeah. and she like pointed, even though it's not a picture of a baby or anything, but right. I was so like just making the connection. And this is a, a, a real striving reader, you know? And they're, they're noticing because of that, to that sound wall, I don't want to get off track, but because of that sound wall, they are noticing like in every other subject, even around the school, I see the or, I see the R, the pirate. You know, I do try to do these like different things as we're reciting, you know, mm. um, and they just, they, I, I'm so, I just get so proud of them, you know. You could talk for days about how good it feels, yeah, right? Yeah, so I'll stop talking. Mm -hmm. Thank, no, 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 everybody could. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that information. And with just maybe a minute left to go, just one question. I think the bottom line here is, how do you know, Lisa, that evidence-based uh, literacy works? And I think everyone, you know, in, on this webinar would really want to know the answer to that too. So if you could you just know, quickly, how yeah, do you know? Um, my, I, Phone for me, and like I said, I'm in, I have an integrated classroom. For me, um, phoneme seg, we do the dibbles, and I saw it last year, um, virtual, virtually, and I'm seeing it this year. The progress that they're making, um, you know, with the phonemic awareness, being explicit with that, that whole piece um, has really, I, I'm, I'm seeing great results. And same with the great. complex text. Great. Thank yeah. you so much. And I think Catherine's going to be joining us now. Thank you so much. Okay. Andy. Yeah, sure. Yes, I'm back to do some Q&A that we have received from the participants. And um, the Q&A has been very active. So I want to thank everybody on the webinar today for all the questions you've submitted. We have some great questions for you, Lisa and Beth. 
Um, before we get to questions for you, I'm going to give you a moment to take a sip of water because I'm going to answer one of the questions myself. Oh, good. Um, several questions came in regarding um, curricular materials and how the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is assisting districts in choosing high quality instructional materials for early literacy. So um, I would invite any of our participants to check out the Massachusetts Curate Pro Project. Um, if one of my colleagues could chat the link to curate, that would be appreciated. Um, so DESI brings together panels of Massachusetts educators to review curricular materials for early literacy, as well as other subjects and grades, and provides ratings on the quality of those materials. So if you're looking to know how high quality your district's materials are, or perhaps your district is looking to select new materials and you would like a resource to learn about instructional material quality, I highly recommend you check out the Curate Project. Um, we received a question about why some of the most popular programs used in Massachusetts haven't been reviewed by Curate. The answer to that is that um, the Curate Project reviews materials that have been submitted by publishers for review. Um, due to legal constraints, we're not able to review materials unless the publisher presents them for review. And so materials that haven't been reviewed, haven't the publisher hasn't come. So I hope that answers your question. And now we'll turn to much more interesting Q&A with the panelists. Um, so let's start with the question about students experiencing reading difficulties. And Beth, I, I know as an interventionist, you'll have a lot to say about this. So we'll ask you to speak first. Um, we know that many students who are experiencing reading difficulties might sneak through or fall through the cracks, particularly as they get up into grades three, four, and five. And when they emerge as experiencing reading difficulties, they may be, um, really truly struggling as readers and requiring a great deal of intervention that could that struggle could have been prevented if their need had been met earlier in the years. So Beth, can you share a little bit about how your school ensures that students who need support are identified and receive the support they need so that they don't fall through the cracks? Sure, Catherine. So what we started to do is um, hold, try, um, annual data meetings. So we meet three times a year. And then we, as grade level teams, work in between the fall and winter data meetings. We talk at grade level meetings about student data. We have strengthened our assessment tools. So we have a great dyslexia screener where we're able to highlight and identify students that may be at risk. And I work at a primary school, so we're pre-K through second grade. And I'm a huge advocate for early intervention. Let's hit them hard early. Give them the most intervention early on so that when they do get to our sister school, which is grades three through six, they hopefully will not need that. We're progress monitoring all the time. And I'm in constant conversations with my colleagues, with our administration saying, you know what, we've been doing this and it's not getting the gains that we want. What can we do differently? So we either boost up our intervention time and we try that for a few weeks. We look at the progress monitoring. Is it working? Is it not working? And then if it's not working, we go back to the table and say, what else can we do? So it's always a conversation. And I'll say I've worked in many different districts. And what I've seen work so well is for the student support teams um, that I know all schools have. The best ones are when you have an occupational therapist there, a physical um, therapist there, the school psychologist. They have so much knowledge of how to tweak instruction or to try a different activity, or maybe it's an OT thing of the motor planning that's interfering. So when you have all the brains um, put together to brainstorm, you can really make a strong intervention and the student will soar. But a major piece to it too is the homeschool connection. I get the most information from my families. I call them, I say, what have you noticed with their development? Have you ever seen this? I ask a lot of probing questions because oftentimes parents don't know what to look for mm -hmm. or what might be a red flag um, or questionable. So I gather all that information because 
my philosophy is every student is a puzzle and we need all those pieces in order to put it together to help them succeed. So until we have all that information, you know, students can fall through the cracks. So we have to work really hard to get the background information and to see what's working now. And if not, don't give up, try something different. And while you were speaking, a couple of people popped up to inquire what dyslexia, or excuse me, what early literacy screening assessment you use. Sure, we use um, Dibbles 8 um, for our screener. But right after that, then I always do like the QPS, which is a quick phonic screener. Um, I also use a phonemic awareness screener from Hegarty just to have different data to triangulate and see where the gaps are. And then I make sure I include all those lower skills into my lessons. So when you really hone in on the point of breakdown, I'll say that all the time, but it's so <laughs> true. Um, you can't just you know jump into foundations where they are and repeat the foundations lesson. Like if they're doing foundations for long vowels, but yet they don't know their short vowel sounds, it's not going to work. You're still going to have cracks in the foundation and that's what happens. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa, I wanna to hop to you for the next question mm -hmm. um, because you talked about what a big change you've made in your instruction from how you taught earlier in your career to today. Yes. Um, so somebody asked about um, that when you wanna make a shift towards a more structured approach to literacy or more evidence-based approach to literacy, especially if you are formally a balanced literacy style um, teacher or using a basal, it's a big change. It takes a lot of time mm -hmm. to, to collect all the new resources and make all of the updates to your teaching. So um, I know you're someone who stays very active and up to date on research and instructional resources. What are your tips for um, gathering this information, pulling it all together and in a manageable way? Um, well, I mean, I, it can be very overwhelming. I mean, it really can. There is so much information out there. Um, I mean, I, I probably would say, um, see, this is probably, it's probably going to sound crazy, but one of, one of the, um, the sites that I'm on is on Facebook, but it's actually the science of reading community. Um, and it is, there's a lot of teachers. There's a lot of resources, um, a lot of teachers willing to sort of share resources. And, and because it's obviously national, um, you can get resources from other um, states that are doing some really great things. Um, so I, I would recommend, honestly, especially if you're um, there, there's one specifically for um, K to two or K to one. Um, and I've gotten a lot, I've gotten a lot of resources from there. Um, the mass literacy guide is right at our fingertips. <laughs> it, it definitely has a lot of information, um, but also it, they could, I would always recommend like check out even some of the webinars that um, Desi has hosted, um, you know, if there's a, a certain piece that you're looking for, um, because you really have to kind of start small, you know, and sort of pick one area um, and kind of focus in on that. Um, start, start small is great advice. And our conversation today focused a little bit more on fluent word reading, but as you mentioned, there's tons of resources related to other aspects of literacy, language comprehension, complex text, yeah. pick somewhere and start there is great advice. And, and anyone can reach out to me too. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and what I would suggest too is look at your data. You know, what areas are your students continuing to struggle at? And go to the Mass Literacy Guide and find that area and look at the recommended readings, you know, Start mm. there. Where is the biggest need? When our district was making some changes, I had shared that one of our biggest needs was phonemic awareness. We didn't have any curriculum. It wasn't done in the lessons with the curriculum that we had. So that's where we started. And we got a lot of bang for our buck and we saw great student success. And now we're moving on to another piece. So start small, identify yeah. your area of need, 
for your students overall. And, um, you know, the mass literacy guide is amazing where it has like the best resources. And I would start your learning journey there. Well, I want to thank you both. Um, your insights, your experiences, your wisdom is really so valuable. Um, and it's amazing to be able to uplift your voices and share them across the Commonwealth. So thank you very much, Lisa and Beth, um, thank you. for being here. Um, I wish we could answer 20 more questions that came in from participants, but unfortunately we're out of time. Um, so I'm just going to reshare my screen so that we can briefly close out. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, one another of my MRA colleagues, Holly Banashevitz, who's going to share about some upcoming additional learning opportunities related to the Mass Literacy Guide and to close us out. So over to you, Holly. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, we'd like to invite you to join MRA and DESE again on February 1st, when we will explore literacy leadership and the MTSS model. This session will also feature Massachusetts educators speaking to their use of evidence-based practices. You can register via the link on the flyer, which is being dropped in the chat right now. Also, to continue the learning, you can check out the new recommended reading section of the Mass Literacy Guide. We truly hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Thanks again to our featured educators, Lisa and Beth. If you have any further questions or comments, you can reach out to the DESE Mass Literacy Team through the Mass Literacy site. You can also connect with the Mass Reading Association at massreading.org. And both of these links are also on the link sheet. Thanks again, and we hope to see you all on February 1st.